Okay, have we handed out the coupon again? Let's do that. And we'll cover this, but so V straps, it's, I got stupid on it. A V strap, how to tie down a, tr a tree. I put a video on it. They're all like 60 seconds. Here's what it is and here's how to use it. So if you want to play with it, just don't have it, have your video playing while I'm talking. Wow. You know what? Could you do me a favor? I think it's, is it warm enough in here? Like, actually, it's all about the speaker. Why don't you turn off the uh, heaters? Because I'm like roasting. Awesome. Okay. So, hey, welcome to today's garden class. We're talking about fruit trees. Which ones grow up here? Which ones don't grow up here? How to plant them, how to prune them, how to take care of them, how to get the most harvest. So that's the goal in, in an hour or less. That's what we're going to do. So just boom. And I'll save some time at the end for Q&A because I know there'll be, it's like we could go all day with just Q&A alone. So we'll have to keep focused or we'll never go through the subject matter. So fruit trees. So we're, we're loading up right now on the fruit trees that can be planted up here. Um, and we'll go over this, some examples here. I know they're twigs in a bucket, but it helps me keep track of which ones to mention. Uh, my name is Ken Lane. I am the owner of the Garden Center. So my wife and I have owned this for 20 years, actually 20 years last year. So it's from now, I guess, 21 years. Uh, our daughter, Mackenzie, uh, I've got four kids. One, my youngest, my protege, has taken interest in taking the Garden Center to the next generation. So it's three generation owner, Garden Center. Uh, my father-in-law started Lisa's father started the garden center back in 1962. So that's kind of the lineage of where we come from. And we have got some serious garden experience here in the mountains of Arizona. We have farmed throughout the central highlands. We've had garden centers all over the place. This one's our newest garden center. We built this one in 1983. We've just been adding on to it, big greenhouses. As the community grows, we're able to expand and grow with it. So we're kind of limited. We live in an island. It's not like I can go out an extra five miles and hit another 100,000 customers. No, it's just us living here in this Central Highlands area. So Prescott, Prescott Valley, Dewey, any more? Paulden? How many Paulden people are here? I knew it. You guys are, are taking over. Paulden and Dewey are the big, big growth areas coming in. So, uh, and you can grow amazing fruits out there. You know, okay, all you pollen people, back with me. Come, come back with me. Come on back. I know you're, it's a party out here, breaking out the Mai Tais or something afterwards. So, uh, okay, that's gardeners for you. It's very social, very energetic, very, we like to share. We also look like uh, floral or funky gloves and big, beautiful hats. I mean, it just that describes us as gardeners. Um, and I'm right there with you. Uh, so let's cover, let's go over the negatives, what to watch for. Let's just get it out of the way. You cannot grow citrus up here. Get over it. You can't grow avocados. They don't grow up here. They freeze out in the winter and they die. So those, those plants will go down to about mid-20s before they vaporize and they just don't come back. So they'll take a light freeze, but they won't take deep freeze. And we get, I mean, it's been in the teens at my house this week. That would obliterate all of those. The other one to watch, the other one, let's go over nuts. 
So we don't grow the ponds up here. So there's a break, about under 5,000 foot, they start to grow. Uh, I've grown some beautiful pecans on a Skull Valley. That's at 4,200 feet. Once you get up here, I've grown pecans up at the Prescott Heights, uh, up above the high school area. Uh, they were beautiful trees. They just never put nuts on. So if you actually plant it for the nuts, probably don't go with that. I'll show you which ones you do go with. Uh, walnuts do amazingly well up here. Uh, those will do because we've got our black walnuts that grow up here. That's a native one. Uh, the nut is, it melts in your mouth sweet. I mean, it's just so good. The problem is the shell is so thick, you'll never get to the nut because <laughs> you just can't crack this thing open. It's hard to get into. But the Carpathians also grow up here. That's the soft-shelled uh, walnuts, okay? Uh, almonds are probably the best bet. They're easier, easier to maintain. They're less messy. And we'll go over that one as well. Uh, we have to go over, uh, because... It's basically this, the great state of Maricopa influences everything the state does, including all of our garden news. So you'll hear all this garden content coming up out of the valley saying, oh, plant this kind of, plant this apple tree, plant these. Be really careful what content you're consuming and where it's coming from. Verify. So, so read and verify. Uh, or just follow us here at Waters Garden Center. We'll, we'll set you straight. We're trying to. Um, what happens down there is they're, they're, they're going over uh, plants that, that bloom very, very early so that they can harvest before the heat of summer. We don't want that here. We want them to bloom very, very late so we can go through the heat of summer and harvest late summer and fall. So the, the plants that grow down there, pretty much if you've had success, just, just erase that from your mind, re reboot, reset, start over. Because the plants up here are better, those will bloom so early. I see so many, so much influence. So this is a box store. They go here, send fifty of these trees to all of my stores throughout Arizona, and then we're seeing trees that should be grown in the desert. They're growing up here, and so people will plant that apple tree, a summer summer apple, and then they're going. I have this beautiful tree, but it's never produced fruit. I've heard if I had a nickel for every time I heard that. Uh, that's because they they've planted a desert variety that bloom too early, it sets some fruit. Then we get a frost, it takes the fruit. So the tree is healthy, they'll, they'll grow fine. It's will they produce fruit. So it's all about chilling hours. So let's just, this is, we're going real deep. Let's just start off deep and why we're doing this. So you want a fruit tree that needs at least 650, 700 chilling hours or more. That is, they're programmed after they've seen so many hours of cold, below freezing temperature, they've got a, a switch in them that says, okay, now it's time to bloom. So desert varieties will have a couple hundred to 300 chilling hours. So they bloom very, very early. Whereas apples and pears up here, let's say a Macintosh apple or a, a Granny Smith or a Honeycrisp, these, these, these apples that we know and love, they grow really well here because they have typically about a thousand chilling hours. They're not going to bloom until April, really. So we're getting out of that risk of frost. So you want them to bloom as late as you can. With that series, there's a, some fruit trees just naturally bloom earlier than others. So if you're just starting out, start out with apples and pears. They're the last ones to bloom in spring. They're the most consistent at fruiting. They, they're, they, it's almost guaranteed we'll get some produce off of those every year. Now, last year was a little awkward. Last year was a bad year. It's zero fruit anywhere. I mean, I've been the, the judge at the county fair, and there's been no fruit to judge. It was all frozen back in spring. It's pumpkins. That gets boring, judging pumpkins all the time. A few berries. I mean, come on. Uh, but you want apples and pears and cherries and apricots, nectarines, pluots. You want to, you want to judge those. Well, they got, we had this real freakish cold the end of April that took out all the fruit. Just, that's very, very unusual. Uh, but most, most of the time, we will we'll have fruits coming out. Now, that being said, so out of all the fruits, apples and pears bloom the latest. So you get the most likely to have fruit in spring. The next one's going to be cherries and peaches. They'll usually bloom right before the apples and pears. 
a couple weeks or so. So, so they're exposed a couple more weeks to potential cold. We'll go over some tricks on how to get past some light cold, but just start with planting the right variety that bloom the latest as possible as you can. Um, then you'll come into a plums. There's quite a, plums do very, very well up here. And then the first ones that bloom in spring, usually by the end of March or so, they're starting to bloom. In fact, you'll see some of these have very large flower buds on them right now. They want it to be spring. They're tired of cold, just like you and I are. They want to bloom, they want to grow, they want to take off. Those would be apricots and nectarines, okay? And those two, they bloom early enough. You better be, it's either feast or famine with those. You have so many apricots, you don't know what to do with them all. You don't have enough friends or canning supplies to take care of this because the harvest is so great. Or you get like three apricots. <laughs> that's it. You'll feast or famine. You only get, that's it. So last year was a famine. So if the frost goes, because the, the, the fruits did not put any energy into producing fruit last year, usually the, the current year, they're going to be blockbuster. I mean, it's going to be a good heart. If the frost allows, if the, if the spring allows, it will be record uh, like fruits. In fact, we're trying to figure out how do we, this whole thing of uh, things are crazy expensive right now. It's got people going, you know what? I could probably grow my own apples for cheaper than that thing. I can't believe I grow my own tomatoes. We're seeing this trend of, um, I can do this myself. So there's a, there's a, a renaissance of, of vegetable, herb, fruit tree. We're trying to figure out how to get more. We've, we, we committed to this crop like three or four years ago. We handpicked it last summer. So now you're seeing it show up now. I'm going to need more because the us gardeners are saying, dang it. I can grow my own, I can, I can have my own eggs if I got a chicken. I can get my own fruits off my own trees. So we're trying to keep up with the trend. So I think that's where we're going to go this next year. The good thing is for my friends, you all, you came to a class in February, 1st of February. Snow's coming like on Monday or Tuesday. You're sitting here, that's, that's, that's a hardcore gardener. Um, you get first dibs, so you can plant right now. I know there's snow coming. You can plant that right now, and it would be fine. The plant, in fact, it'll be better than fine because it will start to wake up on our own cycle because it's exposed to our to the same climate that our, our the rest of the trees in the yard are, are exposed to. So it's a good time to plant. The great thing about now is it's not the most popular. The most popular time is peak of spring, May. It's the hardest time to grow, and you don't have as good a selection. Right now, we're bulking up for the class. We're bulking up for spring. We've got spring open house. It's our 61st spring open house. We're filling up this place with a semi or two a week. We've got over, we've got over two acres to fill up in the next three weeks. So it's like this mass rush to fill the place up. Uh, the first pansies will show up. The first uh, edible like lettuce and spinach and that kind of, they'll all show up next week. So it's, it's, it, we're, we're in a rush. You get your best choice now because there's more selection. More sizes, more varieties. Uh, as we get into May, they start to be picked off. And, and I'll still have a, I'll still have honey crisp apples. I'll still have Alberta peaches. I just won't have as many sizes or won't be as much like now is a better choice selection. So just because of timing. Okay, so we go over um, frost. Our last frost of the year typically. Is May 8th is, is the official 100 year. We've been tracking this for 100 years. May 8th is the last frost, Prescott, Arizona. You folks in uh, Prescott Valley, you're different. I think you're May 7th, basically. It's a, day, it's a day difference. Chino Valley is the same. I mean, we're all the same. We're in the same. You are not special because you live in Dewey. We're the same. So the last frost, you want to make sure you're watching that because if you've got loads of plums or peaches or cherries on your plant, on that tree, and we're expecting a potential frost, you'll need to protect that to keep the frost. If that fruit freezes on that tree, it will drop off. It just it's it turned into an ice cube, destroyed the fruit, the tissues, the plant gives it up and just lets it go. So kind of protect it. Uh, let's just cover that real quick. How do you protect it? You either cover it with a blanket, frost covers what we have, white, thin white, uh, uh, breathable fabric. 
we throw over it. A sheet would do just fine. If you can get one big enough, go, go California king size, that size. You want to keep it, keep the frost off from lighting on top of that fruit and the foliage. Um, some of you, your neighbors next to you are not crazy when they hang Christmas tree lights up in the tree. They're just trying to throw a, a warming, something that warms, just enough warmth underneath that sheet or in the core, in the canopy of that tree that it takes the edge off. I've, I've hung a shop light with not LED, not these fancy, you know, energy efficient lights. We're talking wasteful, incandescent, if you can even find them anymore, something that throws off heat. You want that in there. Uh, and usually that will do it. That'll take you down easily to mid 20s. Once you're going down to low 20s and teens, it's, kind of, it's all over. It's just there's no way to recover from that. You can't protect that tree enough to heat it enough. So that was what we had last year. Last year, we just went from beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. One event, just like one night, killed everything. Came right back. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And so that was a freakish thing. We hadn't seen that in probably a couple decades. But it's potential. So just kind of be, be aware, be ready. Do not use plastic. Plastics, if you use a big sheet of plastic, it does more damage than good because what it does, it holds the cold in longer into the core of that. It doesn't, you want something breathable around that tree, not something that holds the cold. So it's just, I've seen a couple mistakes on that. Uh, the other thing you can do is just go small. I don't know, Ken, can I help you with this? this does this show up on camera for those? Can, that, can you see that? Hi, folks. We're, we, we're trying to recognize you're tuning in. You should come <laughs> visit us anyway. Just come on down. Um, this is a dwarf peach tree. I think really? it's a peach. That's really Yep. Funny. This is a bonanza peach. It only gets this big. So it's in, But it puts on not like just the tree is miniature. The fruit is regular size, like a regular old peach. It's actually quite delicious. My mouth's watering just thinking about it. So, But these are all flower buds. So it'll bloom here another month or so. Um, it's cute containers, raised beds. Uh, I've used them in garden, actual flower bed kind of stuff where it's decorative gardens because they're just beautiful trees. Uh, peach flowers are just delicate. They're beautiful pink. And then you get this fruit on it. Even in, even in, a, in a flower setting, fruits are just beautiful. So, I mean, your mouth water is just waiting for them to harp to, to, to ripen up. They're just a beautiful decorative, like ornaments all over the tree. So you can use them in a different way in the landscape, whereas uh, regular sized trees are typically more of a shade tree or orchard kind of tree. So they're just bigger. I've used them to shade patios, that kind of stuff. So this is dwarfed, only gets this big. Then you've got standard size. That's when your grandparents grew. Or a lot of the bigger you folks in Paulden like your standard size. They want them bigger, so you get bigger properties. So those are going to get up typically 20 to 25 feet or so. I guess you can, if you're going apples and pears, they can get up into the 30 range. Typically, fruit trees are short trees. I mean, not like a sycamore or a cottonwood or maples. They get up to 40, 50, 60 feet. I mean, these are like three, four stories tall. These guys are meant to be shorter so you can harvest them easier with a, with a fruit picker or something. Um, that's standard. Then they've got one that's called semi-dwarf. So you've got standard, semi-dwarf, dwarf. Standard's gonna be the regular old size you're used to, okay? Uh, it's gonna be 20 to 30 feet tall. Semi-dwarf is gonna be 25% low, 30%, something like that. They're the next click down. So they still are a substantial tree. They're still a tree but they're just shorter, so they're easier to harvest, easier to get to, especially for smaller smaller yards, smaller lots. That's probably the way to go, go for, okay? So semi-dwarf. They'll typically be in the teens, so 15 to 20 foot range is pretty normal. So, and you can easily get 15 feet with a, same thing there with a pole picker, you can easily get to fruits or keep it trimmed down. You can easily keep a semi-dwarf down to 12 feet, you know, the back fence line or something. So those are your three different sizes. As you read the tags, you'll go, if it, doesn't, if it just says Macintosh apple, standard. If it says semi-dwarf Macintosh apple, it's a semi-dwarf. And the way we're doing that is we'll graph, we're using certain rootstock. So we're picking a rootstock that tastes clay soil. And then we're gonna, we're, we're going for clay first because we know what kind of 
soil we have to grow into. So we're taking a rootstock that can do that. And then we're going, do we want it to be big, medium, or small? And then we'll graft that variety, honeycrisp or a Bing cherry, we'll, we'll graft that onto that rootstock. So we're, we're manipulating the entire, it's not, we haven't changed the DNA. We're doing that by grafting onto certain kinds of rootstocks. Okay, so it's truly organic, it's not modified. You're not gonna kill your puppy dogs by DNA modification. We don't, we're not into that anyway. Uh, but grafting is totally kosher and, and very ancient uh, way of, of producing fruits. This is, you'll see the graft here. In fact, let's, I had a beautiful one. This is stunning. This is a pixie, pixie. And I got this one just because you can see the graft so well. This is a glorious tree. Oh my gosh, broke it. This is, this is, uh, this is the original rootstock right here that limits the size, how big that that uh, tree will actually grow. And then we grafted this pixie, pixie peach onto this rootstock. And then we'll root it out for about three or four years and finally it comes in here. Eventually as it matures, it gets, the trunk will be like substantial. You'll never see this. But on every single tree that we sell here at Waters Garden Center, we're not starting by seed, we're starting by graft. It's a preferred, it's a way of you getting exactly that type of fruit that you're using. If you want a red Alberta peach, if, you, if we do it, do it by seed, you get red, yellow, green, you get every kind of genetics you could think of. This is a way for us to get exactly, it's that peach every time. It's a clone of the exact mother plant that we took that cutting off of, get onto that rootstock. So we're going deep into grafting, but that's why and how that, that we're doing that, okay? Make sense, questions on that, got it? I see a lot of heads going, yeah, 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 yeah. There's always one in the crowd, not, not the front row, going in the middle of the pack. So just to make sure I understand, yep. you're grafting, the fruit is going to be identical on the dwarf, semi-dwarf, or extension. Correct. If it says, yeah, very good, so what he said up for you folks online, we're trying to keep you involved. We're like front row seat right there. Um, he was asking, so if they have a standard semi-dwarf or dwarf, let's say Asian pear, it will be the same fruit every time, but because of the root, of, because of the roots, it'll limit. The fruit is the same, the size of the tree is different. Yes, very, very good. Yep, yes. Just a question. I, I've only had the Alberta peach. Yeah. I absolutely love the flavor. And are these as good, better, whatever? Oh, now she's asking my opinion. I love it when women ask my opinion. I don't get that at home. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Alberta peach is her favorite. She loves Alberta peach. Uh, are all these better or worse is her question. I'd say stick with Alberta. If your mind set up for Alberta, it grows. Okay. So Ranger, some, of the, some, some varieties have more chilling hours than Alberta's. So Alberta's the number one seller. The ones that produce better are Ranger. There's a couple others that are uh, that are bloom a little bit later out, so they're more consistent produ producing the fruit. Um, they're all semi or cling free. I mean, if you're going to get a peach or something, get one that doesn't cling onto the peach. It's easier just to melt in your mouth and come right off. That's ideal. Uh, I, I like red Albertas myself because they're just pieces of art. It's an Alberta with a red skin. Now we're getting into personal opinions. So a peach, sort of as a peach is a peach, more so than pears. Pears, there's a great variations of pears. So you'll get from Asian pears, which is almost like an apple. I mean, it's, it's an apple that tastes like a pear. They're beautiful. Um, they're, and they last a long time. The, the, the shelf life on them is much longer than let's say a Bosque or, or a Bartlett pear, which are your more traditional type of pears. Um, Pears are one of those things you want to be ready to harvest because when they come off, they're all coming off at once and you need to be, be ready for it. So you get your, your leathers going, get your canning going, get, get, start eating like crazy, give them to friends, put recipes with a fruit picker out by the front rock so your neighbors can have some, just be ready because there's, there's a lot of fruit that comes off of them. So, okay, so thank you for the opinion. I'm gonna send you two, let me give you this. So. We got to go over pollination. I don't have time to go over every pollinator, which one goes with which. So I just put them all into a, into a chart. Here's apples. Here's what pollinates. 
every kind of delicious apple and, and, and vice versa. So I'm just going to email that to you if I could. So instead of, I could print out, it's like, it's a, it's a substantial list. This is like a, anyway. Also, I've got a book that I wrote for local fruit trees. It's basically a summary of what we're talking about today, or actually, this is the summary. I'll get you the book. It's a free download. You can read it on any, it's a PDF, so you can read it on any kind of device. That'll be coming your way shortly. So, so we don't have to go over so, so intensely what, what, what pollinates what. Basically, what it comes down to is pitted fruits will pollinate themselves. Most apricots, peaches, nectarines pollinate themselves. Plums, there's a few of them that will pollinate themselves, but they'll do better with a buddy. They need, and when you say pollinator, it's not two Santa Rosa plums. You need two different varieties. So you need a black beauty and a Santa Rosa. They pollinate each other better. You need two uh, um, uh, pears. You need two. Yes, Bartlett's will produce some fruit by themselves, but typically the fruits are smaller and less of them. If you had a pollinator, if you put it with a bosque or comis, all of a sudden you get more fruit and bigger fruits on both trees. But you can't, you can't have the same. You can't have two uh, Granny Smiths. They got to be a Granny Smith and a, and, or, and a uh, uh, Fuji pollinate each other. So you need different ones. Okay, so, so now we'll go over cocktail trees in a second, but we've actually grafted, like on an apple, four different types of, we're getting artistry of, of, of gardening basically, but there's four varieties of apples on one tree uh, and they're all made to pollinate each other and harvest at different times. That's called a cocktail tree. You'll hear about it pretty often um, when, you're, when you're researching stuff. We tend to specialize in that because it's just fun. I, I get bored. This is like my 30, this is my 31st season at the garden center. I started when I was a very young man and now I'm still a young man in my head. So, uh, but I've been doing this a long time. You just get bored selling the same old Honeycrisp apple. I want something, I want it to sparkle at night or glow in the dark or attract fairies. I want something else because I get bored. And so grafting is an easy one, multi trunks, that kind of stuff. So we'll go over some of that. Also the lots are becoming much smaller now. So because values are just skyrocketing. So you shrink down the property. So there's not a room for orchards like there used to be. A smaller tree off the patio is better. And one instead of three to, to pollinate. So we're getting more and more of that. If you've got a tree within your neighborhood, within line of sight, so for me to, as far as you can see, it, the bees will pollinate that plant. They do not need to be side by side. If you put a barn or a shed, Bees are dumb as mud. If they can see it, they'll go for it. If they can't, they get derailed at all, they won't pollinate it. They can see it. So, so two houses down or the next road across the road, if, if those two trees are within line of sight, they will pollinate each other. So if, well, if it's a wall, if it's a shorter wall, you should be okay because trees are typically bigger, uh, but no, not more, more barns. And some of you have the bigger, some of your bigger properties, your horse folks, you got serious barns. I've had some of those. And so I know you don't want that in the middle of it. Maybe a garden shed would be okay. Just, just think line of sight. If the bees can see it, you're good. If they got to do a, a dog leg to get over there, eh, it's probably not going to work. So you don't have to have, I'm giving you permission to share your trees with your neighbors and help, help each other pollinate, especially in the tighter neighborhoods. Frequently the, the trees are pollinating each other. They want to pollinate. Just got to give them a reason. Yeah. If we're already on the list, do we need to sign up again? Yeah. So, uh, so this is only going to, there's like 10,000, 11,000 people on this, on our garden club, basically. I'm not sending, I'm not polluting every email out there. It's just for you all. This is just for you. I mean, this is a private email, probably from my desktop to yours. So just, just, just if in doubt, put it on there. Yeah. You, if you want that handout. So there's a clipboard going around. So. Yeah, you can you can email it back. You, I, I can. Yep, you can reply with questions. I'll probably have my uh, lovely assistant here reply for me, so I've got helpers that help me. Uh, I don't have chat bots yet, but I'm looking. So, but right now it's just me. So it's kind of there's three or four of us that kind of answer the emails. But yes, you can go right back. Okay. 
Yes, okay, there, I'm back, at, back with you. Thank you for derailing me for a second. Where was I at? We were on uh, pollination. pollination, that kind of stuff. So um, a, a peach will not pollinate a plum, a plum will not pollinate a pear, a pear will not pollinate, it's gotta be two apples. They pollinate, two, pe two pears, two peaches, two cherries. So it's gotta be the same, same species different varieties pollinate, okay? So that seems to be a confusing part. And again, you'll have that pollination chart, simple one-page chart. Here's all the pairs, here's what pollinates what. Uh, we'll print those and put them into the uh, tree racks as well. It's just it's, We just got our fruit trees yesterday, so I haven't had time, we're just setting them up, so I haven't had time to put the signage back up. So in the interim, this is my way of giving you a shortcut. Print it out, put it in your garden journal, whatever. It's share it with neighbors, go right ahead. I'm giving you license to go for it. No copyright, whatever. Just, just I want that information to get out there. Um, okay, so we went with apricots and nectarines bloom first. They'll typically be in full bloom and setting fruit by April 1. Okay, that's, we're full on spring at that point. Uh, lilacs are in bloom. Forsythias are starting to come off their bloom. They're, done, they're putting on green foliage. Uh, the red buds are in bloom at that point. All the maples and aspens are just, everything is growing at that point. But there's a potential for frost. And if the frost comes, it can take some of that fruit. If that fruit freezes, it's gonna go. After that, you got plums and cherries. They're the next rotation, so it's always the first ones to bloom, apricots. Then it's the peaches, I mean the uh, plums and cherries, and it's the, the uh, uh, peaches. Then it's going to be apples and pears, the last ones to produce fruit. So if you're just starting, start with the ones that bloom the latest, so you're most likely to get fruit. My, my thought. Uh, what is the definition of an orchard? An orchard is six trees or more is defined as an orchard. Just, I don't know, garden fact, just so you know, just for fun. So if you got a yard that has six or more, you've got an orchard. If you don't, you just have a backyard garden. So it's just different, okay? So um, let's start down here. I wanna cover a little bit of pruning. How are we doing? We're half, half hour in, okay. We're on track. I probably don't have to drag these in front of the camera. I just want the camera to be able to see a twig on camera. That probably doesn't even pick up, but you've seen buds. This is all the flower buds. This is a all-in-one almond. Almonds do amazingly well here. Uh, I couldn't get them last year, this year. We're coming off of this supply chain thing. So this, this building boom that's just, just sucked up all the plant material. Uh, we're now catching up. And so almonds, I couldn't get to Asian pears. I couldn't get apricots last year. Just, there was none. They were all gone early. There's no, there was no going back to the well. This year I went, we're stocking up, we're going for it. Now hopefully I can sell them all. I think I will, but according to class, I'm sure I'm just fine. Uh, but this is one that was hard to get a hold of. Almonds are a shorter tree, typically about 18, 20 feet tall. So it's perfect for a smaller yard. Beautiful, delicate flower. Um, all in ones, it's got the male and female on the same plant. So it will produce fruit by itself and it will pollinate the halls and all the other all the other uh, almonds as well. Okay. So if you like nuts, this is probably the best producing nut tree at this altitude. So the, the elevation, what gets us that, that swing between day and night kind of messes with trees sometimes. Number one selling plum, Santa Rosa. It's that purple plum with a real sweet uh, uh, flesh to it, kind of lighter colored. Um, again, these are all, all of these are butted up, ready to go. Fruit trees need to be at least five years old, typically more like seven or eight years old before they're old enough or mature enough to produce fruit. So you can find cheaper fruit at other places like a big orange or blue box, but they're selling you whips. They aren't of fruiting age. So if you actually want fruit in the next like three to five years, plant one that's old enough. And all the trees that we sell here at Waters, because we know our customer base, if I had a nickel for every time I heard, I don't want to wait, I want now, I want it produced this spring. That's what we try to fulfill. So we're trying to even bring, bring in even larger, we're trying to bring in instant specimen trees, because some of you have a lot of money. It's not about the money, it's about, I just want it big and full, I don't want to wait, I want it, I want it now. 
and you're shopping at Waters. We can help you with that. So um, anyway, that's this is Santa Rosa plum. This pollinates by itself, so self-fruitful. It also pollinates a lot of other different kinds of plums. So this will this will go elephant heart to to uh, blue uh, uh, burgundy beauty to all the others. This one pollinates all of them, but it's the number one seller. I don't know why. I think there's better plums, but it's consistently it's a consistent fruiter as far as uh, fruit trees go, plum trees go. Is this the one that has a sweet skin as well as the sweet? Uh, no, she's asking, is, does that one have the sweet skin? In my opinion, um, it's got a kind of a bite to it as you go into it. And then it, it's almost like a persimmon, which yeah. persimmons grow here too. Uh, you bite into it, you go, oh, it's that kind of flavor. So Elephant one? hearts and some of the others, uh, 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 black beauty, those are sweet through and through, like melt in your mouth, just like right now. Oh my gosh, I can't believe fruit could be that. That's heavenly kind of stuff. Yep. A quick question. Uh, I live in the Ponderosa Pines. Yep. And I tend out my forest really good. Yeah. Good. That's good. And the sun comes in. Yeah. So he's, he's growing in the pines. So we do have a lot of pine forests here, junipers or whatever. How much sun does a fruit tree need? Pretty much was the question. Six hours or more. If you can give it six hours during the growing season, right now it doesn't matter. They don't have foliage. While they have foliage, you'll need at least six hours to produce a nice fruit. If you get it less than that, they'll tend to lean, or all the fruit will come on one side. Things will happen where it just does. It needs at least six hours. What about yeah. pH levels? Yeah, pH. We'll go over that in a second for how to plant and stuff. So, uh, pretty much, needles don't change your pH because they break down so slowly. I wouldn't worry about it. So, you can't get your soil acidic enough here. So the pines, usually folks are worried about being, this, being too acidic, not here. So your water is so alkaline, you're going to compensate for that instantaneously. Um, this is a Moor Park apricot. Apricots, this is one of the last Mormon and Moor Park. Those two, the M&M &M, uh, folks of apricots, are the only two you really want to grow up here because they, they, they bloom real late. They're more consistent at producing their, their, their fruits uh, because it blooms so, so late. I think this gets 800 shelling hours. I'm going from memory. So it's real. It's just going to bloom towards the end of March, 1st of April. Not some of them bloom first of into February, 1st of March. Just They're just so many weeks ahead. It's hard to get them to produce. Yeah. Moor Park and Mormon apricots are the two I would, just my personally, what I would go with. You hear of others. Um, and this is one too. I don't know what kind of, uh, um, not to put pressure, but I didn't have apricots last year. There's going to be pent up demand. I've got some apricots now. I hopefully, hopefully I have enough. The computers tell me I'm good, but I just don't know what, what the community, how many apricots the community really is, is wanting. Cause I have backed up, uh, already we're making phone orders just because people knew they were coming. Get it, put them aside, here's my card. So, so if you're thinking apricots, or pears or almonds, I would say just get them today. Just, just go for it. So you got them. Apples, I got plenty. Peaches, I have plenty. Of course, I see that this year. Um, pluot and apriums. How many have heard of pluots and apriums? Awesome. That's cool. We're getting really fun now. So pluots are about 50 50 plum apricot. So it looks like an apricot, but it tastes like a plum. So if, you've, if you are a person that has everything or had had everything, you just want something new, pluot. It's a good, fun, and it does produce quite well here. Apriums are more apricot. So they're like 60, 30, 60, 70, 30. They're, they're more apricot with a plum. They have a plum, they have less uh, hair on the skin like an apricot does. So it's more like a like a plum, but it tastes like an apricot. Very pretty fruit. So we're trying to get more of that specialized because we know some of you have actually done everything and grown everything. We want to give you something new or add to the orchard a, a different thing. So we've got some of the specialty stuff. So that's that's what this is a dappled dandy pluot. It's probably the original, the original cross where they first started. Uh, they do it through grafting and pollination stuff. Um, 
this is the one that they started with probably 15, 20 years ago. Aprium's a fairly new introduction, probably the last 10 years or less, probably even less than that. Just introduced, just coming online more and more. Uh, Asian pear, got that one here. Uh, Asian is that apple type of pear. So it's very firm and it does exceptionally well here. It produces very, very well this elevation, surprisingly. Um, this is one of those, oh, do I pull that down? Let's try. This is, that is a fruit cocktail tree. <laughs> so you've seen all these tags on it because this is a different fruit than this one. And we're naming, so this has got uh, uh, Matsu, Gala, John of Gold, and Fuji apples on one tree. The beauty, and we've already pruned it, so Grafts is already starting to get its spacing to it. So this branch will go out in this direction. It'll be like this vase-shaped plant. And then the galas will typically come out. You know, I think John of Gold's come out first, then galas, and it just rotates. The beauty of a cocktail tree, or more than one variety on one tree is, you're not harvesting the entire tree at once. I don't think any of us truly need four bushels of, of Fuji apples, but one would be really great. I got another bushel of galas, another bushel of, and so I find the beauty of this is it helps you pace the, uh, the harvest. So they're not all coming off at the same time. Plus, for smaller yards, this self-pollinates itself. So you only need one tree and they're, they're put on there so they, they take care of themselves. So we're trying to be strategic on which model, which varieties we're grafting together. They grow up here, and then they help pollinate, and then they're harvesting at different times. And so that's our goal when we're, when we're trying to decide which ones do we graft. There's 40 apple trees. Which ones? That's how we pick. Okay. And so this has got a graft down here. It's got a graft on each. It's got a graft in each one of these. And so you'll see that graft. So when you see a graft, let's see. This was a good example here. You're seeing this cut, so we made the cut. We put grafting wax on there to keep disease and bugs out. Uh, that's actually, don't worry about that. That's actually a desirable thing. That means you've got a better tree because it's been designed to grow for you the way it's specified. Does it make sense? It seems to confuse some folks. They don't like to see like cuts and stuff. That means it's been worked and, and, and it's been, the artistry of the tree has been put into that, especially when it was younger. Yeah. All right, so that's cocktail tree. Those two I've already talked about. Let's go over how to plant and how to keep gophers off of them. If you've got pocket gophers, you folks out in the valley areas, that's like gopher heaven. It's like from, from, from the backside of Prescott Valley, Chino, all the way to Paulden, drops down the skull. That's like gopher, it's like the great gopher arc. So these, these mounds of dirt that show up, they love fruit trees. They're delicious, so they eat roots. And the roots of fruit trees are very sweet, so they're attracted to them. Literally, I've had gophers, I had an established apple tree, old, old guy. I could put my arm underneath it and come out the other side because the gophers had eaten. I'd, it, again, it was older, I hadn't been taking care of it. I'm taking over the property, and now this old, in an orchard, um, it finally, it produced really well because it was so stressed out. I was thinking, this is my last year. I'm going to blow them like crazy. But it kept going. So, But I finally got rid of the pressure from the gophers. If you've got that, don't let them eat your tree. So I've got a couple tricks. If you've got gophers, we make gopher shields. This is a, it's like chain mail for trees. It's stainless steel, stretchable steel that you, you basket, you plant the roots into. The roots can go through the basket, but the gophers can't come in this way. If you have gophers for the love of gardening, don't waste a hundred bucks on a tree and have them just eat it. Do something simple. Now, if it's already planted, that's different. So if you've got something you're trying to keep them off of, there we've got traps and baits and come, that's probably a sidebar uh, conversation on how to deal with that. But up front, at the very beginning, if you know you've got some pressure, just put them in a basket. It just, as, it, as that root grows, it expands out with it and keeps the gophers off. So it's just for 20 bucks, multiples in a box. It's just too easy to kind of take the pressure off. Yeah. Yep. 
Yeah. Yes. So, so, so she, she doesn't have gophers, but her neighbor does. Should I be worried? Yeah. yeah well, mama's mom. So in my yard, uh, mama. So the voles are bad right now. So I'm catching at least one or two voles per week. So I've got a trap line, multiple traps around. And mama has picked, picked out the babies and the gophers are right after them. So by March one, in the next couple of weeks, the gophers are sitting there in the nest. She's going to kick them out. When they do that, they start running everywhere. They're not going underground. They actually come up, and at night, they just run, uh, trying to get out of the way of hawks, blue herons, all things that are predators, the snakes, all that kind of stuff. They're trying to run. They'll find their own place, so they'll come up. And, and if you've planted a new tree and a little baby is running across the yard, they're going to go, look. It's like easy digging. I can get in real quick. Yeah, there's a free meal. So they're more attracted to your fruit trees because of that. So kind of just, if you don't put them in a basket, at least keep it on your radar. When you see mounds, go after them. I mean, go all, I mean, go marine on them. Just go all in with everything you got. So yeah, be, be worried. Uh, a pocket gopher? So we don't have moles, but we do have pocket gophers. Hey, Ken. I think I, I feel like I got to go come this way. Can they see me online or something? Are we still okay? Just making sure you folks online we get that thing right. <laughs> uh, how deep do pocket gophers go? Right now they're about three to four feet deep because it's cold. They're starting to come back up. So they're starting to come. We're starting to see a grub show up. That's that white worm. We're starting, customers are starting to dig. I think partly we're getting our soils ready. And so we're seeing what's in the soil. I just had someone bring in this most beautiful cutworm. I mean, it's just huge. Never seen anything like it. it had to be from last year. I think it, it was from Mars. But you plant lettuce and stuff or cabbage or broccoli, and it comes up and just cuts that thing, cuts the, the, the stem right off. And so it was sitting there in the soil. They were deeper. Now we thawed. What's happened is the thaw is here, and so now they're starting to come up because they're hungry. They've been sitting there cold for two months. Now they're coming up going, what can, I'm hungry. I want to eat. And I want to become an adult, make whippy, and lay more eggs here in your garden for you. Um, gophers the same way. They've been real deep. Now they're coming up. They're starting to be active. So my guess is you might not see mounds quite yet, but they're up there starting to work. Within the next two weeks, are you starting to see them already? Okay, so we're already seeing in the, of course, pollen sees them. So you've, you never stop. So that's like I've never seen. It looks like a bomb went off in the field. There's so many of them. It's crazy. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we they come in multiples in a package so prairie dogs. so do you have prairie dogs cool where do you live ashford it's gonna say williams ashford awesome uh, prairie dogs are not your friend they're not as aggressive they don't go after things like like gophers do so they're but they 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 eat things so they're and they're ground dwellers they're just really big they're like Gophers on steroids. So 30 out six from about 100 yards, be about right. So kind of watch that. So yeah, 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 yeah. So as a kid, so I grew up here. As a kid, that's where I spent a lot of time, that north of the cement plant, Ash Fork, and prairie dogs were a fun hunt or whatever, quail, dove, all that kind of stuff, yeah. I don't know why I derailed there, but just I... Bonding with my Ash Fork customer. Awesome. <laughs> I didn't know anyone lived up there. <laughs> uh, yeah, things that live in the ground, they're going to eat your stuff. Don't let them. What we're finding right now, and I brought a sample, um, we're seeing a lot of grubs come up, so white worms. They eat the roots on your plants. They are not innocent. They are there. They're your nemesis. Don't, if you see them, kill them. So don't, don't just go, I found one. You've got dozens. Just, just find the ones you have, organically get rid of them, or feed them the chickens or something, and the rest of them bait that bait that garden area because you've got more that you don't see, and I predict there's some that are lower. They're, they're just they're coming up. We're just starting to work. So if you see that, it's called grub free zone. This one granule takes them out for the entire year. So just put it down once, and you're done for the year. So there's some others out there. They're a little less expensive. They're not as good. We're bringing in the better stuff here for longer. We want you to work once, and then it's just done. You don't have to worry about it.
So, diatomaceous earth is an organic way to do it. In my chick, in my uh, uh, vegetable garden, I'd go diatomaceous probably, or there's another one. Okay. But in, in orchards and bigger properties, I'd go with this. Roses, I'd go with this. Any kind of non-edible, I'd go with that. Uh, diatomaceous earth is an organic like powder that when they crawl through it, um, it cuts them up and they dehydrate. The problem is it doesn't stay in the soil past the next irrigation. So you got to reapply all the time. And it doesn't go in the soil very well. So it's more of a top dress, better for uh, earwigs and mealybugs and uh, pill bugs, that stuff that crawl on the ground, really good. Stuff that are in the soil, not as good, but much safer. You got chickens and stuff, it's much safer. So it just depends on what, what you're trying to do. That's why I'll try to I ask you a few questions going, so tell me about the garden. I'll try to get you the right one accordingly. My philosophy here at the garden center, what we influence all of our staff and training, always go organic, but first and foremost, make sure it works. If it's so organic but doesn't work, what good is it? So if we, if, if we think if we go, we'll go, we got to go big. I mean, if it's grasshoppers coming across the field, taking over everything, we're probably going to go nuke them, just kind of get rid of those things. And there's there's kinder things out there than just organics. So some of your organics, like nicotine sulfate, I stopped selling that stuff. Completely organic, but it's if you look at it wrong, it kills you. I mean, it is dangerous stuff. Skull and crossbone, it's dangerous. So I just said, I don't want to subject my, I don't want my customers coming off puppy dogs because I sold an organic that's just too strong. So we're trying to go, that's kind of our philosophy, what we're trying to do here. Yeah. That size box. What size oh, yeah, that? very good. Thanks for getting me back on track. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. So this is a this is a 15 gallon or 20 gallon, one of those two. Looks like a plum. Let's just see what this is. Yeah, Santa Santa Satsuma plum. I brought it as a pruning example if we get time. Yep, we do. But how to plant it. So when you're planting, don't go deep, go wide. Roots do not go down here. The, the tap root is a total myth. It goes down, even, even very established, mature natives go down about two feet, turn sideways, I call it a hockey stick, kind of, and just starts running this way because it's looking for nutrients and water. And there's nothing down there. There's no nutrients down there, just clay, caliche, rocks, concrete, granite. There's junk down there. Some of you, your contractor buried the trash in your yard. It's going into that. It's all kinds of freakish stuff. I mean, used cars. I don't know what's down there. It's crazy, but it's not water and nutrients. It's going to go sideways. If that's how they're going to grow naturally, just encourage them. So you're digging the hole, the same depth as your bucket, whatever that is. So maybe, what is that, 18 inches? But you're digging three times the width. So wide holes, not deep. This is really hard for you contractors that still own a backhoe. Okay, this is hard, I understand. Just try to barely scrape it open and it's put it in. You also do not want to have that root ball below grade. This is critical. So at the top of this root that you see here, this should still remain exposed to the air when it's planted. And when it rains, it should never get buried in water. So we don't do a rain divot like, like that's where uh, uh, Phoenix, they say, oh, we want a rain harvest. We want to, first of all, they never get rain. So what are they even talking about? But they want to gather, they want it in a basin so it fills up with water. Up here, we get a lot of rain. So you can literally drown the plant if it's sitting below grade. You want it at grade or even a little above. So for my folks in Prescott Valley, do with real hard clay soils, I would say leave here. Leave a couple inches out of the ground and slightly mound or feather that, that, that grade so we can ensure that during the monsoons, so there's two wet patterns, March, typically August, September are wet patterns for us. So that's when root rot happens. That's when the plants drowned, literally. So we'll get these real heavy, heavy snows in March uh, that just sit there and melt slowly, just really heavy, wet, and you'll get root rot right then. And then... Um, Late July, August, we've been watering like crazy in June. Now all of a sudden we kept that water cycle. Now we've got a few afternoon rains through, through the week and all of a sudden we've overwatered that heavy clay soil. So about August, September, we, start, we have this wave of people coming in going, 
What's wrong? It was so pretty. What's going on? It's overwatered. Oh, no, it can't be. Okay, well, all right. That's what you need to hear, but I'm telling you, it's overwatering. And so cut back on the irrigation, and many times it was they listened to the Phoenix Garden News, not the Garden Guys Garden News. <laughs> I'm your friend. I'm your neighbor. We go to church. I see you at restaurants. I see you at the grocery store. We're, the guy in Phoenix doesn't care about you. So plant it at grade or even a little above. You just feather. Then you put your, your irrigation a mound here to help water by hand, or you put your irrigation on top of that mound, and you'll have better luck. Make sure that thing breathes. I do not put gravel or sand at the bottom of that hole. First of all, you take if you take uh, sand plus clay, that's how you make cement. Literally, that's how you make so it just turns rock hard. So you're better off taking a bag of mulch. God, you're hired. If you need a job, you're like, you and I work off, off each other really well. Perfect. Mulch. Uh, this is an old sawmill we have. We been 50 year old tailing. You're just screening it down to quarter inch minus. So it looks like compost. Like looks like rich coffee ground kind of stuff. It looks like rich compost. This is made to keep the soil from compacting back down. So when you dig that hole up, screen anything that's bigger than a golf ball. So roots rocks, debris, that kind of, anything that's bigger than that, because those heat up and they can't hold water molecules very well. So you want to screen that out so we get smaller, smaller particles. Then we're going to take about 25% mulch to our native soil. That plant has to get used to the native soil. We're just trying to keep it from compacting right back down. If you didn't add any organics, it would literally, the next time you watered, go right back to the state. That digging bar you had to use to get it. Some of you are renting jackhammers <laughs> to dig holes, literally. This keeps it from going right back down. So it keeps it, keeps it lighter so the roots can go through it. Plus, most of us are, we're dealing with dead soil. You won't find a worm. You won't find any living thing in that soil. So if you add organics, all of a sudden that brings, that activates that soil. So the pocket gophers do want to run over and dig into that. It's softer, easier. It, incre it attracts the worms. It attracts the mycorrhizal colonies. And so that's, that's what organics do for you. About 25% or one shovel's mulch to three shovel's native soil. That's about right. You could cheat it and go 50-50. If you, if you hit a boulder, you just need some filler. If you're going more than half, it stays too gooey and wet. I would say get a bag of topsoilers. There's some other things you can use to fill up, uh, fill up that to raise the soil up. But about 25 to 50 percent mulch to your native soil. Blend that together. Backfill around the root ball. So um, watch for roots that are root bound. You won't find that from ours. But if you're buying from other places like Home Dumpo. Or Lucifer's Lowe's, or those, those places. Can I say that on camera? Don't send me a cease and assist. Um, those, those areas sometimes will have leftover inventory, and so the roots will start growing like this. If you see that, take a razor blade or pruner and cut those, or root prune them. So hopefully, they'll start growing out like this. Usually that doesn't happen. Once a plant starts, once it's programmed to circle like this, it keeps doing it no matter what you do. Just keeps going. You want them to grow like this, out. So just don't buy leftover inventory. Buy fresh new inventory from Waters Garden Center. You'll be better. I'm telling you, it'll make a difference. Okay, hold on. Um, so we're back all around that packet. Make sure that this, the biggest mistake I find, this graft right here, people like to bury that for some reason, thinking bigger is better or deeper is better. Don't bury this. If that graft, here's the graft, starting to heal over. If that graft gets dirt on it, you'll get what we call crown rot. You don't want anything to do, any rots. Rots are bad for your feet and for your trees. So don't, don't, don't get dirt up on this. Leave it exposed. In fact, leave this whole area exposed to, to the air. It's healthy for it. It needs to breathe. Um, just make sure your, your soil's out that way. Okay, so that's a big mistake I find some folks make when they're planting. Um, the other one, too, and when I'm all done planting, pack it in, water it in really good. I'll put uh, the uh, vegetable, fruit and vegetable food. I'll, I'll sprinkle this on top. Some of you are obsessive compulsives. 
You know who you are. You like to blend everything together and you think you're doing, I'm a shortcut king. I just want to get it in the ground and I sprinkle it on top. You can either blend it with your mulch and native soil mix or just sprinkle it on top. Just either, just get some food on there. You have no nutrients in your soil. You'll need to add some. Uh, so that's what I'll do then. Then I'll water it in, all that in with root and grow. This is compost tea. It is freakishly hard on plants to be transplanted from the root. This is what it's known most of its life. Now it's in your yard, surrounded by junk. It's not going to be happy. And so I'll use this. It's a compo I'll, It's concentrated, so I'll put it in my watering can. I'll water things in really well. I'll, I'll hit this about every couple of weeks, a couple times a month, until I see that it's leafed out and starting to grow. And I go, oh. I'm such a gardener, it's growing. Take a, it's, then I'll cut it off of this because it's obviously past the transplant shock and it's, it's starting to root. As soon as you see foliage growing, you get roots right after that, just like boom, boom, just like that. So as soon as you see new leaves coming up, it's, it's rooting out underneath. Okay, so three things. You need mulch, you need food, you need root and grow. I would say, just a second. I would say also, most importantly, Stake your fruit trees, stake trees. We're in a windy area, but stake your fruit trees. See, more folks lose their trees. Literally, the tree will load up with so much fruit. This thing's gonna hold 200 pounds of fruit. If it's lopsided, if you get a prevailing wind that gets it to growing to the Northeast, then it loads up with 200 pounds like you swinging on it uh, with a windstorm. I've literally seen fruit trees fall out of the ground, literally fall over from the weight you need to make sure that thing grows straight up. So as the weight, so the weight is distributed over that entire, it is so critical. I can't emphasize it enough. And so we do have a prevailing wind that grows here that just blows from March through the end of June. It's unrelenting, day and night. It's always, so you'll see a bunch of trees in your neighborhood that are just leaning. They're always leaning to the Northeast. That's because that's, that's just the way our winds work. Once the monsoons are here, that pressure's off, so now it's just blowing around every afternoon, but it, the, the pressure's off. So make sure they're going straight. Typically with a tree like this, after it's been rooted out for a year, you probably take the stakes off. And the stakes go on either side of the root ball. You're tying once, just so it can move, but not fall over, so it grows straight. Do not place a stake right next, don't place, don't place a stake right next to the trunk and tie it like that. Because now the tree is gonna grow nice and straight, but it can't bend and move. It can't work its muscles. So when you take that stake finally off, it's a very weak tree and many times it will snap in the wind. So because that, that wood is not strengthened as it grew, it'll actually, the wind will actually snap it. So we do get wind shears here that are pretty ferocious. That plant has got to get used to that and it needs to grow straight. So those two things I cannot emphasize enough. And that's why we made a whole bunch of these stake kits yesterday. Two stakes, a V-strap, and wire just for this class. They're usually $19.99. They're 25% off. Just if you're buying fruit trees, get a set of these because you'll need them to, to stake that tree. Keep them on for a year. Next year at this time, you could take them off. Usually what I'll tell folks is snip off the wire next spring see how the tree does, and if it holds up straight the first couple of windstorms, pull those stakes out. If it still wants to lean, well, what's the hard part of getting stakes in the ground? It's getting them in the ground, so keep them there until, don't commit to pulling them out until you know I don't need them anymore, so just test it. You'll know very, very, you'll know by the end of April whether you need that, these stakes again. We leave stakes on too long, I think, in trees, so some of you, You've had stakes on the trees for forever. They don't need them anymore. Not anymore, the tree is holding the stakes up. You don't need that. But does it harm the tree? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, so does it harm the tree? Just keep it, yes. Because it, it hurts me mentally to see that kind of hardware <laughs> on the garden. You don't need it to go, no, just pull them, snap them right off. They'll snap, they're rotted. Just snap them right off. If that tree's over two years old, you probably don't need the stakes on them anymore because they've grown. If you've gotten a couple rings of, of, of wood growth, you don't need the stakes anymore. So we leave stakes on too long 
or the opposite, we don't put them on at all, and we, we get this leaning. And literally, you'll, you watch, if it's a good producing fruit year, trees, you'll get into June or so, it's the, 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 that first leading edge of monsoon, that first gust of wind, it's loaded up with fruit, and they literally will just fall over. I've seen it so many times. Again, I'm trying to help you not make mistakes. I want you to be more successful. We're all going to make mistakes. That's how you learn gardening. I still make mistakes. You just, you want to make mistakes while going in the right direction. You don't want to go backwards. You just always want to go and correct and go forward. That's the goal. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, you said uh, orchard uh, fertilized Awesome. Yeah. So fertilizing fruit trees, um, I fertilize my fruit trees three times a year. But I, this is what I do. I'm doing it in spring, summer, and fall. Fall's the most important, without doubt. But if you're thinking holidays, think Easter, Fourth of July, and Halloween. And here's the reason why. Halloween's the most important because it, the trees are going dormant. As they shut down, they're, they're absorbing a lot of nutrients or carbohydrates into their root structure. That's what they're using to form their flower buds and leaf buds. So that's the most important. When they wake up, they're starting to leaf out. Easter... They're hungry. They've used all that nutrients. You've gone six months since you've fertilized last. Now it's time to put it on again. That's what's going to keep things green. It's going to get you plumper, uh, bigger fruits. And then I like to take advantage of the monsoons. We get a wet pattern sometime in July. We always get rain in July, always. We never know how much, but we always have an increase of humidity. We always get some moisture. Hopefully we get a lot of rain. You just never know. I'm taking advantage of that moisture, that rain so I'm going to fertilize so I can increase my foliage count, especially you folks with newer, newer landscapes. You, it just needs to mature some. You can take advantage of that summer feeding. So that's 4th of July. So Easter, 4th of July, Halloween. My evergreens I'm fertilizing at the new year because you you're looking at some of the ones that didn't get fertilized. They look kind of yellow. We call it winter chlorosis. They got this yellow hue to them. That's obviously a nutrient and pH thing. So I'll fertilize right then my, my evergreens, uh, especially things that are stressed out. Uh, pinion pines I just fertilized a month ago. Uh, they were pinion pine uh, scales on some of them. They're getting kind of thin and wispy. I'm trying to get them to green up and then flush more growth. So This is granular. So what I did, so I've got another fertilizer that's more popular than this. It's called All Purpose. It's the original I put together 20 years ago. But there's this trend to go organic, organic, organic. It's a big deal, uh, especially for my younger folks. You organic gardeners, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so I, I put together a completely organic fertilizer. The other one was all natural, but I put, I put sulfur and iron in it. As soon as you put a mineral in it, you can't call it organic. You call it natural. It's not truly organic. This is 100% organic. So it's 6447. I put 7% calcium in this, because I know you're dealing with calcium deficiencies, especially with tomatoes, peppers, squash, fruits. If you want to bring out the size of the fruit or the flavor of a, of a fruit, uh, let's say blackberries, grapes, peaches, cherries, you want a nice cherry, calcium is what brings that, that flavor and size out. So if I know my customers, I'm, I'm creating stuff for here. So I'm just going to get, I'm going to put it in a formula that's pelletized that you sprinkle out, and, and, and as water and irrigation hits it, it breaks down over the next three months period. So granular, over three month period, that's how you go. You were out, no, 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 we're up here. Right. Uh, when you put it out on the fruit trees or on your vegetables, how far do you take and put it right next to the tree? Gotcha. Out where the leaves are? So how do you fertilize? You're focused on the drip line, so the outer branches, not the trunk. So don't focus on the trunk. Focus where the, so the fine feeder roots are, are kind of, if I'm the trunk and these are my branches, focus on halfway out, out here. That's where all the feeder roots are that pick up the food and the water. At the trunk, all that's there are big anchoring, uh, uh, anchoring roots. They're big, they're thick, they're barky. They can't absorb water or food. It's the finer, like white colored, paper colored uh, root hairs that are further out at the drip line. So whether you're fertilizing a, a, a lilac or a fruit tree or whatever, 
focus further out. You can't go wrong by going further out. You can go wrong by going too close to the trunk. So think further out. That'll help you a lot, okay? Whenever you fertilize, yep. Worm castings. Worm castings are good. You should use them. Oh, which direction do you, that's actually getting detailed. Let me guess, accountant, engineer, I, I could, I could, I, I'm p starting to pin. You guys still have a backhoe. <laughs> I love it. He said Andy still has a backhoe. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter, I find. So you get real when you do some research. I find if you, some say northeast, southwest, I just get two stakes. It doesn't matter. Tie once. The tree's going to do this no matter what. I would say be careful. Don't use rope. Don't use just wire because uh, it's doing this. And you can girdle or cut the bark. You, the, the reason for the V-strap or that, that strap that we put together, because uh, it can move and not, not girdle or rub the bark. That's the reason. So you'll see some folks use uh, old hose with wire through them, all kinds of tricks. We're just trying to make it easy, simple for you. Last question. What's that? Adjust the pH. Oh, pH. So if you're doing what I just told you, mulch, food, root and grow, pH is automatically adjusted. So your pH in your yard right now, probably you've tested right now, is high sevens to eights. Eights are, I've seen, I've farmed in 9.23, which is sterile. I mean, that's basically, alk you're, you're farming in ammonia. It's terrible. We had acid injectors in the, in the well, all kinds of crazy stuff. To get the to get the crops to to, to grow, um, if you can keep it close to seven, you're good. I've seen it. If you can keep it in the sevens, the the book says six point five is the perfect pH. You'll never get there, or if you do, you get there for a moment and then it's right back at you. It's the water that is the pH, and if you've got well water, it's even higher pH. So if that upper basin water basin up in, in Chino Valley, that's very high in pH. The reason that is, just fun fact, or disturbing fact, um, all the hilltops you see around us, those are all volcano cores. So Thumb Butte is, a, is the core of a volcano. That's why it's so interesting. Uh, Glassford Hill, that's an old volcano. Uh, the San Francisco Peaks, one of the largest volcanoes in the West, it's an old volcano. And so all that ash has floated down, and now we're gardening in that ash. Ash is very alkaline, very high in pH. And so if you've got a well, you're, you're poking a hole, straw in the ground, and all that ash, and you're pulling it up, and it's been tainted by, we're all drinking well water. Even if you're from the city, they just have a big old well out in Chino Valley. They're pumping it in here. We're all dealing with well water. So it's very high in pH. You're always trying to lower that pH. Whatever you do, this is especially for you berry gardeners, grapes, that kind of stuff, don't add lime to your garden. You're, you're going to see that here in the next month. That all that East Coast HGTV is going to come on and add, it's going to sweeten your soil. Add lime. Don't do that. You'll kill your soil because lime raises pH. Everywhere else in the country wants to raise the pH. Not here. We want to add soil sulfur. Sulfur is what lowers the pH. So no, the reason our all-purpose plant food works so well, it's got like 5% sulfur in it. That's the only reason, because I know you're dealing with that issue. Because I was, I'm making it for me, I'm just sharing it with you. So I know I'm always trying to lower the pH, and so just trying to help you out as well. So let's cover uh, pruning real quick, or I'll run out of time. Now just some real quick tips. So I've already done this in my yard. So generally you'll start pruning fruit trees. Uh, January through the end of March or so, you've got some window to get it done, but you should get it done before it blooms. So anytime New Year's through spring, spring, the start of spring, prune that, okay? And all I'm looking for when I'm looking at this, I brought this as an example. Uh, again, this is just off the truck, literally yesterday. Broken branches. So I'm trying to get anything that's broken out of there. Things that that grow towards the inside. You want to have the air and the and the wind. Um, things want to eat fruit trees like leaf spot, fungal uh, mildews. They want to they want to they want to grow in the inside shaded areas because these are very high in sugars. So they're more prone to have leaf leafy kind of days, especially your pitted fruits. Um, your apples and pears have more moth worm things. 
The pitted fruits have more disease, leafy things, okay? But like these are growing towards the inside, get rid of them. They're not needed. Just get, get, get rid of that stuff. So you want things that are growing base shape, growing out like this. So I'll focus in on that. I don't want competing like this. This one I might keep. No, I would probably cut that one off too. So you're starting to see it open up. This one's out of there, out of there. I'm also doing something when I do that, that one's broken. I'm cutting off some of the, the uh, flower buds. So I'm thinning the fruit right now. So our fruit, when it does produce, uh, it's so heavy that you want to thin some of that fruit out as you, uh, you start to see a cluster of three to five apples on a cluster. Um, that's too many. So I'll try it. Once I see the fruits have committed, I'm starting to see, oh, that one's kind of weakling. That one's substantial. I'll thin all the weaklings off. I'll take half the fruit off the tree. And I'm looking for the weak, the weak, the smaller fruits. This automatically starts to thin some of that right off the bat. Mm -hmm. So you want a great big substantial pear, you'll need to fruit thin some of the fruit out to be able to, otherwise you'll have, this will be loaded up with peaches and they'll all be this big and half of that's all pit. So if you thinned out half the fruit, you have a peach this big with the same size pit basically. So just kind of, there's something we'll do. And I'll talk about that if you're tuned into us at all radio shows or podcasts or newsletters, we'll go over that as I sense that there's, as I see customers coming in going, oh, that's a concern. I'm going to let the people know and I'll tell you how to do that and when to do it. But trying to get more air, so this is kind of some funky, this has got a weird, what the heck is this? Um, there was one I was looking at here someplace. I was growing, this one's growing kind of weird. I don't know why the crotch was kind of weird. If, if the crotch is too tight, so there's a trunk, if the crotch is too tight, that's usually a weak crotch. I'm trying to look for crotches that are probably 45 degree. Not, not out like this, but, and not like this, somewhere in between. And then as I'm pruning a, an upper limb, as you come up here, so you see these buds, I'll take, I'll go to a bud that I want that's going to the outside. I'll try to go to a bud that's like this, this bud's gonna grow this way. I take it 45 degree angle, cut it, and now that bud will focus I'm growing in that direction. You can control what direction the tree is growing yourself. Just with that one tech, just go, be more, instead of just cutting it, go to where you see a bud growing out like this one, and now that bud will take off and grow in that direction. So you can control the shape of that tree, which way it's growing, okay? I'm not gonna go all into that, but just look for it broken, diseased, discolored, scraped. Um, look for that, cut those out first. Things are going to the to the middle, clogging up the inside. Go for those second. Many times for a younger tree, that's all you need. That's that's enough to open it up. For more established, bigger, beefier, or things that have never really been maintained well, you might might need to get more technical. Now you're going into let's bring back a branch. If you've got a wild branch that's just growing out here like this, and it's too long, cut it off. Don't let it grow anymore. So trees have a growth hormone about 18 inches back. So it, it, once you cut a limb 18 inches back, it stops growing. And it will re-divert its energy into other branches. So it's just a natural, all trees kind of have that. About 18 inch, once you tip it about 18 inches, that branch will stop. That's really important for things like maples. You know, they're kind of wild that way. Uh, locusts, they tend to grow, want to grow to the ground. They want to do that. So for me... I'm 6'1", all of my yard, all trees are pruned to 6'2", or 6'3", because I do not want to duck while I'm walking underneath. Just for me, I want to be able to rake and clean, play, or throw the ball for the dogs without having to ding my forehead. That's just me. If you're 5'8", that's good enough. So we get too technical sometimes. We're not dealing with orchard production. This is not mass commercial this is beautiful gardening in your backyard. It's comfortable for you that you can eat some as you want. So there's a, I take a hybrid approach sometimes. Um, so I've done all my pruning when I'm done. I was, I'm spraying this after the storm pretty much. I want to prune back my perennials yet. This is horticultural oil. Your grandparents called it dormant oil. So it's a real heavy oil. We're using this one because it's lighter weight. So you can spray this up to 90 degrees. You can even use it early summer and it's not gonna burn. So many oils are so heavy, 
it's, it's, if it's blooming or it's got foliage, you can burn back the foliage. And I was having some customers make some problems, having some problems. Said, What's, there's got to be a better product. Does it have copper? So we found this one. It does not have copper. It's just, it's just a oil. And any insects that are resting in that soil, it'll kill them. Also, it coats any eggs that were laid last fall. It coats those and suffocates them out. It's completely organic. Uh, and when I'm spraying, I tend to focus. Just, this is just me. I focus at the trunk because that's where the aphids and thrip were kind of hanging out. I've come across clusters, nests of those. Um, and it's disgusting. Like the ground, like the mulch is moving. It's, it's gross. And so there's no science. There's no book that says to do this. It's just what I do because I've run across this. I focus and I put a little bit of this, maybe more than normal, right at the trunk. Mainly you're looking for the, the main crotches, the main, they get into these nooks and crannies in the main crotches of the trees. That's where they're laying eggs. That's where they're hibernating. Um, is it healthy, the uh, peach leaf curl? It does not, it does a little bit with peach leaf curl. Mainly it's taking out insects, mildew, some spores. Just take out that. I hose down the entire yard with this. My roses, fruit trees, Grapes, berries, all my berries have been cut back already. So I'm just hosing down. This will clean the yard so you don't have insect eggs and insects in your yard. They can fly in, so you'll have insects. But at least I'm starting, ground zero is clean. And I can, then I can maintain from there. So every year, this is probably the least expensive, least offensive, most organic spray you can have. That's just, a, it's a must. Now, we gotta talk bugs. Coddling moth is a real issue here. So coddling moth is the cutest little moth. It's about this big. And they love the taste of apples and pears. If you want a worm-free apple and pear, you'll need to watch for them. You spray with the horticultural oil right as the petals have pollinated and, it, and the, the flowers are starting to drop. Spray it again right then. So what she does is she'll lay an egg just as that flower pollinates. She'll lay an egg right there, and, and before the fruit actually forms and forms over the, the egg, um, she'll lay the egg there so that, that that young, the worm, will actually be enclosed inside the apple. Once it's inside the apple, there's nothing you can do. That's typically going to be a fruit that has one exit tunnel, one worm, so matured inside, came out. The problem with coddling moth is there's about three to four generations that hit us, that hit your fruit trees. And you never know when she's going to be laying eggs. So apples that have had, or pears, have had multiple, uh, ap multiple inter and exit tunnels. So there's more than one tunnel. She laid her egg on an immature fruit. The egg hatched, burrowed inside the fruit. Once it's in there, there's no, there's no going back. Then burrowed back out. So you've got an entrance and exit tunnel. Uh, and she's going to try to do that three to four times on your fruit. But it starts the most important is going to be at the pollination. When the petal, it looks like it's snowing almost. The petals are, obviously it's pollinated, certain blow, spray it right then with your oils. You'll get rid of that first, first wave of, of, of worms. Then we put up in the tree a coddling moth trap. I don't know if the crew brought those up, but there's, on the shelf, there's coddling moth traps. There's a, there's a, a little tent you hang up in the tree and you put it in there and, and if you read the internet, it says, oh, put one trap, solves all your problems. It does not do that. There are so many moths that hit that tree. What it is, it tells you when to spray. It's a monitoring system. So it'll sit there idle for weeks. Nothing's going on. You go out and check it every weekend. It's my coffee Sunday and check my traps morning. Uh, and nothing's there, nothing there, nothing there. If you go out one day and there's like 10 moths in there, going, oh, something's going on. You go in three days later, the thing is filled spray right then. You know they're actively laying eggs on that apple and pears. Apple and pears specifically. They're going after them. It, tell, it helps you to just spray right at the right time. Now the way your grandparents got past this, they just nuked the tree with like diazinon every two weeks. They just, Malathia, the stinkiest stuff ever. They just did it on a cycle. I kind of take the more I'd rather just spray when I know they're active. So, I, so the coddling moth, I would use the oil. As I get into the season, I might switch it up to something more summer, because apples, it could be 95, and that's too hot for that. So oils, typically things you're spraying in the morning when it's cool, takes the edge off, but just some tricks I've learned, 
over the, over the decades, how to grow fruits. I'm a fruit tree grower. I love fresh fruit. There's nothing like fresh off the tree. Those last few days on the tree, it's a game changer to the flavor of, of that and the, and the color of that fruit. I mean, there's nothing like a bowl of fresh blackberries. A grape, we'll go out and eat grapes until we're sick with the grandkids. Literally, we're sick. We're rolling in and going, you can have more if you want. And they think that's a great, they think I'm the greatest grandfather ever. We'll eat blackberries until faces are just covered, covered. <laughs> they came over for the holidays. They come, it's December. Pop up. What? Let's go pick something. It's snow on the ground. There's nothing to pick. I found a, a, a beet that was left over in one of the pots. We found something. Let's go inside and try it. It's like it's like magic. If you want to get that energy of, of the next generation, the next gardening, it's so easy with gardening, just, just with fruits, edibles, I think. So with that, we are an hour and 20 minutes in, and I could keep going. Yeah, online. we got to cover a couple online. So poor Ginger has been waiting. <laughs> Thank you, Ginger. To ask this question. She wants to know if there's a difference between the elder tree that you talked about yeah. and the flower. Oh, good question. Yeah, ginger. So flowering almonds and fruiting almonds, flowering peaches and fruiting peaches, flowering plums and fruiting. There's ornamental fruit trees. So the one that will bloom here in the next couple of weeks, first part of March, is the purple leaf plum. It's a real pink flower to it. it does, it's made to not fruit, just to be the pretty flower, nice purple foliage, those purple leaf plum. Uh, almonds are the same way. They are ornamental. So ornamental, it's not going to form a, you get the flower, but you don't get the nut. Some people don't want the nuts. I know that's sacred to this class. Students in this class go, how could someone do that? Some just want maintenance-free landscape that's pretty. Well, for ornamental uh, uh, flowering pear or Bradford pear, they're stunning. They're one of the first ones to bloom white in spring. They're the last one to turn red in the fall. They got everything going on. Glossy, leaving great shade tree, no fruit. If you don't want fruit, it's a great tree. But if you do, you'd plant a fruiting pear. Same, same species. They're both pears. This one blooms earlier, so it doesn't produce the frost, gets the flowers. It's bred to not have the flowers. Something we've tricked it some way to not produce the fruit. Or if it does, the fruit is extremely small. So it's basically bird size not drop and mess up your driveway size. Does that so. screw up the pollination of actual fruit? What's that? Does that screw up the pollination of actual oh, fruit? Oh, no, it doesn't screw up anything, no. In fact, uh, um, uh, crab apples will actually cross-pollinate apples. So we have an ornamental crab apple uh, that it's blooms at the same time of an apple tree does. They'll pollinate each other. So you can trick, you can do things like that. It doesn't, doesn't hurt. So that's overthinking. That's that. Nope. Don't worry. That's don't worry about stuff like that. So yep. This horticultural oil stain. I would say don't spray it on. If in doubt, it should wash off. But if in doubt, don't hose down that brand new, you know, Mercedes in the drive. Probably park in the driveway before you spray the tree. Just be careful. So kind of watch that. Some some things will will stain like that. Mainly, it's going to be your, your weed killers. We're using a lot of organic uh, weed killers have, have iron in it. That can stain some. Uh, some of the fertilizers can stain because you're putting iron in it. Iron's kind of, a mineral's kind of what's going to stain. A lot of your fungicides, because they're copper-based, those can stain more. Usually, your oils and your, your uh, bug killers aren't stainers. So anyway, just school hard now. Yeah. Yeah, good question. Yeah. So we've got the number one seller that we've been selling for decades was, was all-purpose plant food, 744, all-purpose. Cottonseed meal, bird guano, iron, sulfur, basically. That's the mix. That's a recipe. Um, I was getting more and more calls for organic, so getting some resistance on it's not. I can't call it organic because it's got the minerals. So we made this one. We sold that as a fruit tree food for decades. Yes, you can use it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it is organic. So it's lots of meals, blood meal, bone meal, all the mealy things. So the uh, uh, coyotes, cats, dogs will be attracted to it. 
because that's where the nitrogen is coming from, blood meals and stuff. So they are they like little pellets. So yes, in my backyard, I do use all purpose because I got Schnauzers and Scotties, and the. I just don't want them eating the fertilizer. Just, I just don't want them eating that. So I use that. The, the cottonseed meal is less attractive to them. This, the pellets. The uh, other good thing about this, it will be a repellent to things like uh, rats, rabbits, deer, because it's meals, like blood meal. They smell like death and decay going, something just died here. I'm not going over there. I'm going to go eat the neighbors. So you get some repelling action with it, with your uh, different kinds of, of blood meals, organic meals and stuff. So just kind of, yep. So yes, use all purpose. Yeah. What about when the trees flower and it's super windy? It's like I'm in Chino. Yeah. Good. It's yep. So she's got wind issues because she lives out in the valley, Chino Valley specifically, right? Mm -hmm. How do I keep the wind from vaporizing my plants? So we do have a little insect called a thrip, T-H-R-I-P, thrip also called noceums. They can sometimes bite you and, and, and leave a little tiny welt. Um, they love the taste of flowers. So I find the wind gets blamed for a lot of thrip damage sometimes. So the only way you can see them, because again, their other name is noceums. The only way I can see them is I'll take my cell phone, I'll just tap a branch on top, and if I see the dust crawling around, I've got thrip. I'll spray for the thrip when I see that. Uh, wind should not take, it could take some of the blossoms off, it should not take all the blossoms. If it's taking all of them, it's probably thrip in combination with dry wind. And that's usually May, end of April, May is when thrips kind of show up. It's right when things are blooming. But do that little test with, this, with the phone off. It's a nice black screen. You can see whatever's on there. I use it pretty often for even rose bushes. You'll see aphids crawl. It's scary what you'll see crawling around. Uh, and if you see that, you know, oh, I probably have, I probably, if you see something, you should deal with it. Don't ignore it. It's a problem. Spray it. If you're not sure what to spray with, come talk to us. We'll show you something. So caterpillars are different than aphids. Aphids are different than thrip. Thrip are different than mildews. So. I want to buy it today. What do I buy? Oh, this is by sure, by far. For the, through the end of May, oil is the best way to go. It's just, it's, it's again, least expensive, least offensive, organic. It's got everything that you want. Yeah. Um, I would use some common sense, but it's oil. It'd be like spraying olive oil or something. Is No, you should be fine, but I wouldn't put it in the dog bowl. I mean, some common sense. Spray in the morning, because it's usually less windy in the morning than the afternoon. Just, just some things I've found over the over the. When we're spraying here, we, we use organics. We're coming in early, spraying because it's not windy. By the afternoon, it's a blustering around. So it just depends, yeah. So brambles, so berries, raspberries, blackberries, boysenberries, berries, berries, we will have them all. I don't have berries right now. I'll have, I think they're coming in next week. So my first big load of, of uh, lilacs, rosithia, quince, berries, they're all coming in next week. It's a very large truck of that kind of stuff. So how to prone them. So let's cover birds too at the same time, because I combine the two. So I grow a lot of blackberries, it's my favorite thing blackberries. I'd go milk the goats, can date myself a little bit. My aunt would have me go pick blackberries and she'd take the cream, goat cream, and put it on top with some sugar. And my gosh, I still desire that every morning or every time there's berries coming off. There's something about it. It's a young memory thing that I have. And so berries typically form fruit on second year's wood. So that cane that grew last year, that's the cane the berries are gonna form on this year. So typically you'll try, if it fruited last year, you'll try to cut that one off. So you can encourage new canes, new brambles, new, new vines coming off. And so I'm using bird tape to mark that fruit when it's fruiting. So you're looking at that fruit going, oh, in two weeks, I'm gonna have so many berries, they're gonna be so good. Well, guess what the birds are doing for two weeks? <laughs> They're going, oh my gosh, it's, the cherries are almost there. It's, um, they're waiting for it. So right before, as you're starting to get excited, so are the birds, I'll put a, a, a piece, a long piece of bird tape on there. It's a reflective tape. It spooks them. If you put it on before that, they get used to it. They kind of go, ah, they're just trying to psych me out. I'm not too worried. 
But if you put it on right before, they kind of, they, they freaks them out. So it keeps them off. I leave that bird tape on that branch so I know which one to prune in winter. So I just pruned off all my, it looks kind of funky. Maybe I'll cut the tail off a little bit. I want a marker so I know which one to prune off. So typically, brambles, you're cutting back last year's fruiting wood and you're keeping that new cane that came up uh, for this year's fruit. Grapes. Grapes, you're, forming, you're cutting way back. So I grow mine on a six foot cedar fence. And I don't think, if you just research online how to prune grapes, it's so confusing. I take it in between. I'm not trying to produce an extra bushel of grapes per plant because I'm not bottling wine. I'm not trying to harvest and go to, I just want some, a pretty plant that I can harvest some grapes off of. I think we could take a compromising approach. I'm willing to give up a cluster to have beauty as well. So I grow them up six foot because that's how tall my fence is. I grow it T-shaped out like this along the fence because it makes it look like a, feel like a secret garden. And then I get clusters of grapes coming off of it. That's what I do. That is not in a book. That's kind of a blend between artistry and production. I think we can have it both ways in our backyards. So a lot of this information you're reading about, it's all for commercial production. They're trying to get an extra 100 bushels per acre off of that production. And so my trees are put up higher than they say because I don't want to duck underneath my trees. I want functionality and beauty and harvest. So you have, to, you have to figure that out for your yard, but I take this in between. You have to believe everything that you read. You can, you can, you can compromise, okay? Did I cover that? I forgot where I came from. So, and we can keep going all day like this. We'll take, we'll take one, two, three more questions, and then we're out, and I'll hang as long as you all want. Does that seem fair? I know those seats are getting kind of hard. Yeah. Good. That's actually good. Thank you. So she's got a Santa Rosa plum. It's getting too tall. She wants to keep it down. Let's cover summer pruning. So you prune now to shape it, keep it in check. So I grow peaches that shade my hot tub in containers. Full-size semi-dwarf peach. Not this, not this tiny one. Big one. I want it shading the back of that part of the patio. How do I keep it down where it just keeps it in proportion? If it's too big, it'll blow over in the wind. It's just, it's a problem. So I prune that peach every summer. So it, push, it pushes all this long growth up in spring. It's about to, you're seeing the buds where it's gonna elongate. Usually in June or July, or right after I pick the fruit, I'm cutting back those suckers or branches that, that grew so I can keep it down to size. So if this, this tree has been the same size for 10 years. It's never grown, but it produces fruit every year. Because I, I prune it in the winter, I shaped it already uh, and thinned it out, but then I'll actively keep it back summer. So summer pruning, I think we need to do more if you want to keep it short. So I've kept a back, uh, I, do, I do it now, but summer is when you're really going to actively keep it short. So that we can talk sidebar on more of that. There's a whole class on just summer pruning. Was there something back here? Yep. Are grapes really poisonous to dogs? So are grapes really poisonous to dogs? What I have to legally say is check with your veterinarian. <laughs> what I find is I grow a lot of grapes. I've had a lot of dogs. Um, I've never had one poisoned by my grapes. I think what it really comes down to is yes. If you were to inject them in liquid form, an IV to the dog, it could kill, but they're gonna vomit before they, they, they actually poison themselves. They're gonna self-regulate. So I've never had a dog. I don't even worry about it. I love grapes, I'm gonna grow them. So I, but check with your veterinarian. I'm gonna leave that back door open going, you can't sue me because your dog died from something else and ate a grape leaf. Uh, same with poinsettias. You hear that one? The dogs can't eat enough poinsettias to poison themselves. They're going to throw it up before they get into it. So first of all, it's a nasty tasting bitter sap. Oh, they back here. Anyone else? One last chance. Last chance, right? Okay, right there. Last one. Figs grow here. Pomegranates grow here. We have a certain kind of fig, so we're getting the hardier figs. But yes, and they don't grow tree form. They grow shrub form because the cold resets them. will kill them back to the ground every few years. So they come back from the roots. Of the root. So we'll get big bushes, but regular figs, absolutely. Blackberries, uh, raspberries, poisonberries, and I'm sure they're blueberries, they all grow up here.
Okay, you can grow all those. Right now you're into fruit tree pruning. You wanna get your trees in the ground before they wake up. So if they can wake up in the ground, start blooming and growing right here, you have less transplant shock, you'll probably be able to produce fruit. This is a fruiting age. You'll have a good production if it's in the ground as it wake, wakes up, as it produces, okay? With that, I will hang up. I'll let you clap for me before you go. Thank you very much. And then I'll hang as long as you want. If I didn't answer your...